Let's start again. Good morning, people of God. As we gather for worship this day, it is the 13th Sunday after Pentecost. Considered ordinary time, but these days feel a little less than ordinary, don't they? I'm not going to pretend that I'm not struggling a little bit today, aside from some of the technical difficulties. This past week has been rough. There's been yet another police shooting, uh, protests and riots that have led to the death of others. Parts of the country are reeling after the devastation and deaths brought on by Hurricane Laura. The effects of wildfires are still being felt and we are wading quickly into a political season that is filled with misinformation and political grandstanding and negative jabs on every side. All of this on top of a global pandemic that continues to disrupt every facet of our lives. It can be overwhelming. We need a word of hope. We need a new way of seeing and believing that will give us a way through this storm. But as much as I'm struggling today, I'm also very glad to be joining with you in worship. In this time where... We can take a moment to offer ourselves and offer all of these situations and the many others that we each face in our own lives to the one who knows us best and loves us the most. The challenge for us is always one of perspective, being able to see and trust beyond what we think we already know. So today we're going to explore Jesus' invitation to see a new perspective about our purpose, our place. And ultimately, God's claim on our lives. Let us trust that no matter where we are, the Holy One is present with us. The triune God is with us. May love guide your path, for love is the holiest path of all. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Join me in our call to worship from Psalm 105. Give thanks to the Lord and call upon God's name. Make known the deeds of the Lord among the peoples. Sing to the Lord, sing praises, and speak of all of God's marvelous works. Glory in God's holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Search for the strength of the Lord. Continually seek God's face. Remember the marvels God has done, the wonders and the judgments of God's mouth. Let us sing, O Jesus, I have promised. of self-will. 
now speak to reassure me to hasten or control now speak and make me listen oh guardian of my soul oh jesus you have promised to all who follow you that where you are in glory your servant shall be too and jesus i have promised to serve you to the end oh give me grace to follow my master and my friend please join me in our prayer of adoration and then our community confession eternal and ever loving god deep is our desire for what is true and enduring deep is our need to see clearly Deep is our longing for you, O oh God. In you we live and move and have our being. You are the root of love, the foundation of knowledge, the source of wisdom, the path of right living. You are the beginning and the end of all things. Our thoughts cannot comprehend your mystery. And so we worship you in humble praise, holy God, ever three in one. Although you satisfy our deepest desires, O oh God, we would confess together that we have often turned away from you. We have sought meaning in shallow places. We have clung to old hurts and familiar habits. We have nursed anger and envy. We have been self-absorbed and lacked compassion. We have turned our backs on those in need. Forgive what we have been, amend who we are, and guide us toward what we may become according to your grace. Friends, in our love for others, we discover God's love for us. In our forgiving of others, we learn once more how deeply God has forgiven us. Friends, this is good news offered to us. We are God's children, called to be different, called to act different, called to live as new people. Thanks be to God, we are forgiven. Amen. Let us sing hallelujah to the Lamb. stand in the midst of a multitude of those from every tribe and tongue we are your people redeemed by your blood rescued from death by your love there are no words good enough to thank you there are no words to express my praise, but I will lift up my voice and sing from my heart with all of my strength. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah, hallelujah. By the blood of Christ we stand, every tongue, every tribe, every people, every land, giving glory, giving honor, giving praise unto the Lamb of God. Lord, we stand by grace in your presence. We're cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. We are your children, called by your name. Humbly we bow and we pray. Release your power to work in us and through us, till we are changed to be more like you. Then all the nations will see your glory revealed and worthy. 
worship you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah, hallelujah. By the blood of Christ we stand. Every tongue, every tribe, every people, every land. Giving glory, giving honor, giving praise unto the Lamb of God. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue confess that you are Lord of all. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah, hallelujah, by the blood of Christ we stand. Every tongue, every tribe, every people, every land, giving glory, giving honor, giving praise unto the Lamb of God. Amen. I hope you were dancing a little bit at home to that one. Our gospel reading today comes from Matthew 16, verse 21 through 28. From that time on, after Peter's confession that Jesus was the Messiah, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are, not a stum you are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, if, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who say, lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has done. Truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Let us pray. God of wisdom, you teach us with your love, you touch us with your mercy, and you challenge us with your truth. Send us your Holy Spirit to help us understand the scriptures so that we may encounter you as we listen for your living word. Amen. I have to be honest, the verses that we've just read today are not among my favorite in Scripture. There was a time, perhaps, that they were, but as I've lived a little longer with the implications of Jesus' invitation to us, I've come to realize not only how difficult it is, but even more how deadly serious Jesus was in saying it, literally. If we ever thought that following Jesus should be easy, then we've not listened very attentively to his comments to his disciples. If anyone would ever come after me, they must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow. <laughs> we like the image of Jesus as a good shepherd, a great prophet, a, a, a wise teacher, a miraculous healer, a conquering warrior of sorts. And if there must be a sacrificial lamb, then even a crucified Lord. But the image of a Savior who invites us to carry a cross with him, that's almost too much to our bear for our sensibilities. If Jesus wants to carry a cross, that's fine, but, but don't say I must go along with it. I will walk on the side of the road, I'll hang back in a distance, I'll meet Jesus at the destination. I might even help carry his cross. Just don't ask me to, to follow close behind or beside Jesus carrying one of my own. 
cross are you bearing these days? Are you sure it's the one that Jesus invited you to take up or perhaps another kind? I'm learning that there's a big difference. Following Jesus is tough. No one goes on a crosswalk without a cross. And, and the one Jesus invites us to carry might just give us a few splinters. Suffering, death, resurrection. Truly, it is almost too much for us to comprehend. It certainly was for Peter. Why should we be any different? After commending Peter for recognizing him as the Messiah, Jesus begins to explain to the disciples what this means. How he will undergo great suffering, be killed, and be raised again. Peter can't hear it. He, he can't stomach the thought of it all. This isn't the Savior that, that he had in mind when making his great confession of, of Jesus as the Messiah, as the Christ, the Son of the living God. We see here firsthand a, a view of how Peter saw Jesus as the Son of the living God. How he thought that Jesus carrying out his mission would, would be a little different than Jesus' own understanding. The disciples' great hope and the hope of, of many was that the Messiah would be the one to lead a great military revolution against their Roman oppressors. They had seen miracles firsthand. They had witnessed crowds draw to him. They had heard him proclaim the arrival of a new kingdom even. Why would they have any other kind of perspective about what Jesus was there to do? I like how Peter takes Jesus aside. He doesn't want to embarrass Jesus, you see. It would have been a, a disrespectful for a disciple to rebuke his teacher in public, if at all. <laughs> Once again, we see Peter with a, a new confidence taking a step out of the boat. You, you have to love him. His, his courage, his boldness. Notice the word rebuke. It's used in scripture to note a, a calming of things, a, a settling of something. Jesus rebukes evil spirits, calming the soul. Jesus rebukes the waves, calming the waters. Now Matthew is telling us that Peter is trying to rebuke Jesus. In other words, calm a dangerous situation or what he thinks is a harsh word to, to calm things down a little bit. This talk that Jesus is speaking is crazy talk. Jesus, calm down. You're going to, to disrupt the flow here. You're going you're gonna to make people feel a little uncomfortable. They're not going to want to follow you. But notice how it turns Jesus then rebukes Peter because the dangerous situation is him. The storm that needs calming is the one in Peter. The dangerous way of thinking is Peter's thinking that sees only the smaller view of things and, and has missed the point yet again of what Jesus is talking about when where he's headed and why. And if Peter thought that Jesus was about, said about himself was difficult, just wait until he then hears what, what Jesus will have to say to all of them. Discipleship was about to get that much harder, even messier. I don't know about you, but I've heard people say, oh, it's just the cross I must bear. We've heard that phrase many times. Or everyone has a cross to bear. I, I guess that, that this is just his or her cross. Most of the time when people talk about bearing a cross, they're talking about living with something that's really hard or, or painful. Interesting how these words have taken on such meaning. We treat the circumstance or the event that is so painful as if it is our fate and we must just suffer through it. We speak as if there's almost no hope of not bearing that particular cross. In another sense, the idea of cross-bearing has been linked to an almost heroic or, or noble kind of sound. Those who bear their cross and, and die for their cause are seen as martyrs who stand unflinchingly in the face of danger, ridicule, and scorn. They pay the ultimate price for their faith. Or at least their resolve, and they become heroes. Their fate is still death, but their fortune is fame. 
I don't know. I'm not sure Jesus was thinking of either of these two notions when speaking the words to his disciples after rebuking Peter for not having the things of God in mind, but rather human things. You see, for Jesus, the cross was the inevitable outcome for someone who dared to speak truth to power, who would refuse to retaliate violence for violence. That hardly seemed like something a person just has to suffer through but rather a positive choice someone makes despite the pain that will be involved. A choice that's full of hope and possibilities despite suffering. In one way, this might be closer linked to the heroes and martyrs version. But still, Jesus isn't exactly telling us to go and die just so we can be a martyr or a hero who lives in infamy. So what then? What does it mean to deny myself, to take up my cross and follow? What is Jesus telling us? We must ask ourselves these questions in the context of where we are today. The middle of a global pandemic, the context of police violence and reforms and racial injustices, White privilege and power of extremism on every side, economic inequities, Even more, we must ask ourselves this in the context of things like global warming and and droughts and heat waves and wildfires and hurricanes. So what does it mean in the midst of all of these things and so much more? Where do we find ourselves and what does taking up our cross and following Jesus in these times mean? What if Jesus is saying to us that following him will be about making some hard choices, choosing to live among suffering and pain, for example, choosing to be a voice for the voiceless and confront power with love? What if Jesus is saying to us that following him means giving up selfishness and pride and private ambition and all the things that seek to define us so that we can truly take up a new identity, one rooted in sacrificial love and generosity of spirit and compassion? What if Jesus' call to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and, and follow is a call to stop clutching at this life so desperately that we can let go of some of our fears and prejudices and perspectives that continue to harm us and our world and take up a new perspective that ultimately leads to life? We must resist Take up your cross as a justification for suffering. We should reject any notion of take up your cross as some sort of victimization or or martyrdom for its own sake. As Debbie Thomas suggests, to take up a cross as Jesus did is to stand always in the center of the world's pain. Not just glance in the general direction of suffering and then slide away, but to dwell there. To identify ourselves with those who are aching and weeping and screaming and dying. To insist that our comfort isn't worth it unless the least and the lost can share in it too. Taking up the cross means recognizing Christ crucified in every suffering soul and body that surrounds us. Pouring our energies and our lives into alleviating their pain. No matter what it costs. It means accepting against all the lies of our culture that we will die one day. It means following up that that courageous acceptance with the most important question that, that we can ask. Given my inevitable death, how shall I spend this brief, singular, God breathed life? Taking up our cross means that. We give up our right to inflict harm or damage to another person. It means I give up my right to hold a grudge and to offer instead forgiveness. It means that I give up my right to withhold the many blessings I've been given and instead extend them also to others. Paul gives a strong word on this in his letter to the Romans. He says, as far as it depends on you, be at peace with all. We so often think that peace in our world depends on everyone else, but it begins with us. Some of the challenges we are facing as a nation right now, 
There are things we are being invited to consider, perspectives we are being invited to, to see, perhaps for the first time even, ways that would allow us to identify and to be able to, to stand with those who have been suffering for a long time. It's not easy. But then again, Christ never promised that it would be. All crosses are not the same. The one Jesus invites us to consider caring is one that invites us to change our perspective, to see the possibilities that lie beyond the cross, and to understand that not all our perspectives are worth holding on to or keeping. As Thomas suggests, Jesus' rebuke of Peter is so harsh precisely because the temptation Peter holds out is so alluring, so deceptive, and so insidious. You don't have to do the hard thing, Jesus. You don't have to take this, this faith business so serious. You don't have to give up your own rights or privileges or comforts. You don't have to die. And it's true, we don't. There is another perspective on the cross out there. Another version of, of Christianity that calls for far less sacrifice. But this isn't the version that Jesus is calling us to. As Carolyn Lewis explains, yet if the cross is symbolic for defiance of empire, if the cross is representative of the absolute certainty of the incarnation, if the cross is a model for resistance to the status quo, if the cross is a reflection of our human propensity to eliminate the voices that call for justice, for mercy, for compassion, and for love, well then, I'm all for the cross, and I will readily take up that cross any day. So what cross are you and I willing to take up? What cross are we willing to bear? The one that leads to and perpetuates death? Or the one that offers a new perspective? One that does not ignore the hurt, the pain, the suffering, or even the death that we face? but offers us a way through it, a way of life through such things, both now and eternally. I know which cross I want to try to bear. It's not an all at once kind of thing, and I think Jesus knows this when he speaks to his disciples about such things. But he is inviting them on the journey. He's inviting them to follow along to trust and to offer them a new perspective that will lead them beyond the things that are tripping them up now, to see beyond to a vision of the new heaven and the new earth, of God's kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven that we pray every week. I know which cross I want to bear, but I also know which crosses I often find myself getting confused with. The choice will really be up to each and every one of us. Jesus has pointed the way to a cross that, yes, leads to death. But it is one that stands at the centerpiece of time and history, stands in the centerpiece of all the muck and the mire of this world, all that is broken and hurt as a symbol of hope. How this instrument of death could be turned into a, a symbol of hope is beyond anything we could think or imagine doing on our own. But God has done it. You see, as we look upon that cross, we know the other side of it. We know that after three days, Jesus did die and was raised again, offering life and a new perspective to all. So let us claim a cross-shaped perspective that leads to life now and forever. Let us pray. It is so easy, God, for faith to become an escape, a way to avoid the pain of being human and alive or a path to success, a way to persuade the universe to give us the things we want or a system of control, a way to bend others to our will. But the faith you offer is different, Jesus, more dangerous and compelling. 
It's the faith that carries the cross, that embraces death and lays down itself down for the sake of others. It's the only faith that can lead us to resurrection, to life renewed and overflowing. And so we praise you for this faith, God, and ask that you would open our hearts to receive it this and every day. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Friends, there is a lot going on in our world these days. And we are called as Christians to offer our prayers, not as mere statements, but as ways of being drawn in to those pain and suffering, a way of being drawn in so that we can hear God speak to us how we should respond. And so as we offer our prayers of thanksgiving and intercession, I invite you to be drawn in and to listen carefully for how God would invite you to respond. Please join me. O oh God, in whom we live and move and have our being, we come to you in prayer as the seasons begin to change and we prepare for a new season filled with many challenges and still many opportunities. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give you thanks for the occasions we have enjoyed savoring the beauty of your creation right outside our doors. Thank you for the chances we've had to catch up with family and friends, for opportunities of recreation and restoration in these days of summer. We are grateful for each moment in which we find rest and relaxation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Today, though, we remember those for whom this season of life has been difficult, those still isolated by the restrictions because of COVID-19, those who go hungry or face violence in forgotten corners of our own communities and around the world, those whose businesses are struggling, who have to figure out how to be inviting and safe and at the same time be profitable and to be able to stay open, and those who are uncertain how to engage with friends and neighbors and still be wise and careful in this strange time of pandemic. We think of those who have gone back to school, who have been sent home from school. We think of those who are simply trying to make it through the day. May each one find courage to face tomorrow in your company. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh God, just as Jesus walked the road of suffering with so many in pain and grief, we remember those whose lives have faced crisis in these days. Through tragic death and unexpected loss, through critical illness or injury, through pain or problems that seem to have no end. Surround them with your comfort and compassion. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh God, Jesus often faced many demands and the pressures from his critics. And so we pray for all those who do not find rest so easily. For leaders trying to figure out ways forward to care for their communities when there are no examples to follow. For those whose jobs and responsibilities have changed and every day presents a new challenge. We also remember those all who seek work in these uncertain economic times. May they know your strength and assurance day by day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Oh God, we need the embrace of your presence each in our own way. Bring healing and peace to our lives and to this world you love. Open our eyes and our hearts so that we may offer healing and peace to those we encounter. In the name of Christ, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Let us sing, Take Up Your Cross, the Savior said. said if you would mind disciple be forsake the past and come this day and humbly follow after me take up your cross let not its weights Pervain your soul with vain alarm. His strength shall bear your spirit up. Sustain your heart and nerve your arm. Take up your cross, nor heed the shame. Let your foolish heart repel, for you the Lord endured the cross to save your soul from death and hell. Take up your cross and follow Christ, nor think till death to lay it down. For those who humbly bear the cross, one day will wear the glorious crown. As Jesus' followers, we have the privilege of taking part in the redeeming work of God that God has begun in this world. Today we offer our gifts in anticipation that God will use them and us in that work. The offering will now be received, however that you choose to do it. As we take a moment to consider our gifts, I encourage you to make use of our website and our giving page for gifts to support our ministries and our outreach. Let us offer these gifts of our lives so that others might know God's hope, God's healing, and God's presence in their own. Please join me in prayer. Oh God, we will not proclaim our faith with our words only, but with our lives and these gifts we offer you today. We pray that others might be transformed by your grace, your hope, and your peace, and offer these gifts to you in hope and thanksgiving. Use them to transform the world you love with the good news we celebrate in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I know I can stand secure. Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I put my hope in your holy word. I put my hope in your holy word. I have a living hope. I have a future. God has a plan for me. Of this I'm sure. Of this I'm sure. Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I know I can stand secure. Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I put my hope in your holy word. I put my hope in your holy word. Your word is faithful, mighty with power. God will deliver me. Of this I'm sure, of this I'm sure, Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I know I can stand secure, Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I put my hope in your holy word, 
I put my hope in your holy word. I put my hope in your holy word. We go taking the love of God into the world, genuinely sharing this good news with everyone we meet. We go taking the grace of Jesus into our communities, sharing the joy of those who rejoice, mingling our tears with those who weep. We go sharing the Spirit's community with all we meet this week, welcoming everyone, especially those who feel alone and afraid. And now may God the Creator, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit the Comforter bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen. Go in grace, love, and peace. Christ is with you. Thanks be to God.